Okay, now we get to it. This is not my first introduction to Dr. Maury Gertz, but it uh, is my first virtual one. Uh, here's uh, one of the ASG's favorite amyloidologists, Dr. Maury Gertz from the Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Gertz. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go give an overview in anticipation of some of the organ specific um, presentations. I think I will now share my screen with you. So you can see as I begin my introductory remarks. In trying to conceptualize what's going on with amyloidosis, you need to understand about the way in which the normal body operates. Virtually everything your body produces is biodegradable and recyclable. And so that things are reutilized over and over. And typically, since I'm a hematologist, I usually refer to the blood. If you think about the red blood cells that carry oxygen and keep you from being anemic, the uh, oldest red blood cells in the body are about four months old. And after approximately four months, they'll head to the recycling center. And at the recycling center, the various components of the blood cell will be recaptured so they can be reused, such as iron uh, and globin, which uh, is part of the oxygen carrying proteins. When patients develop amyloidosis, however, the system for recycling becomes impaired. And so proteins in the body that are normally biodegradable and recyclable no longer really can be broken down. It's as if you assembled furniture with a half inch screw and a half inch nut and you assemble it using a half inch wrench. And then all of a sudden you wanna dismantle it, but you've lost your half inch wrench. All you have is a three quarter inch and that makes it impossible to unscrew the nut. In other words, you can't re disassemble the chair or the furniture. And when that happens in the human body, the inability to disassemble or break down the protein renders it non-biodegradable and therefore it can't be recycled. And as a consequence, these non-biodegradable proteins, which we refer to as amyloid proteins, deposit in various organs of the body. And when they deposit in the various organs of the body, they begin to interfere with the individual function. There are many different types of amyloid, but we're going to be limiting our discussion to the AL type of amyloid. And what that means is that the source of the non-biodegradable, non-recyclable protein, the source are abnormal cells in your bone marrow referred to as plasma cells, which you can see in the center of this slide, there are plasma cells that actually on the surface show antibody proteins, which are actually the source of the light chains. And the light chains are the non-biodegradable, non-recyclable protein subunit of AL amyloid deposits. These light chains are the same immunoglobulin free light chains kappa and immunoglobulin free light chains lambda that you're having serially measured in your bloodstream so that you can have some sense of how you're doing with regard to the therapy of your amyloid. And when we say AL, the AL stands for amyloid light chain. And again, these light chains are sourced in the bone marrow with abnormal cells called plasma cells. So although many of you may ail, because the kidney is leaking protein or your heart is not functioning efficiently in terms of its ability to circulate blood into your tissues, or perhaps your nerves are damaged and lead to numbness and problems with your fingers and carpal tunnel syndrome, this is fundamentally a blood-related disorder. 
And so usually with regard to the therapy, it's usually done in the hands of someone who specializes in the management of disorders that involve these abnormal plasma cells. And in the end of my talk, I'll talk a little bit briefly about that. But I've been asked to really talk about the way in which amyloid produces its problems. And so here you can see a colander. This is something that every one of you has. You'd use it to cook spaghetti or boil peas or mixed vegetables, and you use the colander to drain. And the kidney actually is extremely similar in its function to this colander. And the principle is that there are small holes, and what you dump into the colander when you're talking about the kidney, it's actually straining your blood. And the blood pours into the colander, and what comes through the holes in the colander is urine. And the important elements of the blood are captured in this colander and therefore are retained within the body. The principle of the colander is the size of the holes. If the holes are very, very small, these holes will be able to strain the bloodstream and retain all the important elements. If you were using this, for example, to strain sand, the sand would come through because these holes are not small enough to strain sand. But if you're straining peas or carrots or you're straining spaghetti, the holes are more than adequate to adequately keep in your system what's wanted and let the urine pass through. When amyloid deposits in this colander, however, what it does is it punches very large holes in the colander. And when there's very large holes present in the colander, what ends up happening is the water, the urine, pours right through quite normally. But some of the contents of the blood plasma pours through these large holes in the colander and end up in the urine. I'm not Dr. Picken, but I know that this is a kidney biopsy. And what you're looking in the middle is actually the colander. That's the filter of the kidney referred to as the glomerulus. And what you see here is just a bunch of pink material. It's just pink and smeared all through. And the pink substance that just looks like someone threw bubble gum down, that actually is the amyloid. And that amyloid has interfered with the colander so that it leaks. Now, what's leaking? Well, if you look at the plasma in the blood and you find out what the plasma consists of, the plasma consists fundamentally of protein. And your blood protein is critically important to you because it helps keep water from leaking out of your circulation, out of your blood vessels the protein holds that in. However, when there are holes in the colander, the plasma proteins actually leak through the holes and end up in the urine as protein in the urine. And when the protein leaks into the urine, the amount of protein in the plasma falls because it's all being lost as it spills out into the urine. And when the blood protein is depleted in the blood circulation, that leads to leakage of water. And so typically what will end up happening is you'll get puffiness and swelling in your feet and in your ankles and in your calves. In severe instances, fluid will actually leak around in the space between your lung and your chest wall, and there'll be fluid accumulating around the lung. In some instances, some of the fluid will leak in your backside and you'll get puffiness at the tailbone. And in some instances, the fluid can actually leak into the abdomen and your abdomen can become a bit 
bulgy or protuberant because water leaks there because there isn't enough protein in your bloodstream to hold that in. So I wanna go back and talk a little bit about the source of the problem. The source of these amyloid proteins, these non-biodegradable, non-recyclable, the source in the bone marrow are these plasma cells, which you can see in the middle. And the way I like to discuss this with patients is to refer to the bone marrow as the garden that makes all your blood. And the bone marrow actually has seeds. The seeds germinate into plants, the plants bear fruit, and the fruit is the blood. And the blood is, of course, what carries oxygen to your tissues and what's clotting your blood. It helps fight infections. And in a normal bone marrow, in a normal garden, a normal adult will have plasma cells present in the acreage of this garden, but these plasma cells will only constitute approximately 1% of the cells in the garden. But when patients go on to develop amyloidosis, these plasma cells become deranged and abnormal. And when they do so, they begin to overpopulate the garden. So as they grow within the garden, the bone marrow, the garden biopsy will show increases number of plasma cells. And in an amyloid patient, virtually 100% will have some degree of these abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow. At diagnosis, the average patient where the normal is 1% will have from 5 to 10% plasma cells in the bone marrow. But patients can have 20%, 30%, up to 80%. It's, it's possible. By agreement, cancer specialists say that if there are 10% or more of these plasma cells, or if you want to refer to them as garden weeds, then we refer to it as multiple myeloma-associated amyloidosis. If it's less than 10%, we just refer to it as AL amyloidosis. But in both instances, the underlying principle is the same. There's an abnormal plasma cell, if you will, weeds in the garden. And all of the therapy that we are currently giving are really directed to kill those garden weeds, to kill the plasma cells in the bone marrow. And whether that's bortezomib, better known as Velcade, or daratumumab, known as Darzalex, or pomalidomide, pomalist, or exazomib, ninlaro, or cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, or dexamethasone, all of these are fundamentally can be conceptualized as weed killers designed to destroy the plasma cells, destroy those cells in the bone marrow. And again, why? Well, because it's the plasma cells that are making the light chains, and it's the light chains that are non-biodegradable and non-recyclable, so they build up and they accumulate in the tissues, leading to the heart and the kidney and the liver and the nerve to function incorrectly because the non-biodegradable substance interferes with those organ functions. And so one of the clues, diagnostic clues, when we see patients who have heart problems or kidney problems or liver nerve problems is to measure the level of light chains in the blood. There are two types of light chains, kappa and lambda. And in patients with AL amyloidosis, 75 to 80% of the patients have abnormal lambda free light chains and about 25% roughly will have kappa free light chains. And those do not cross over. If you have lambda amyloid, then you have lambda light chain elevation. If you have kappa amyloid, you have kappa light chain elevation. When we talk about those specific light chains, if you have lambda amyloid, 
and have lambda light chains, we refer to that as the involved light chain. And if the other light chain, therefore, if you have lambda, then the other is kappa, that would be the uninvolved light chain. If you have kappa amyloid, kappa's involved, lambda's uninvolved. And typically what we look at are the changes of the involved light chain. So for the majority of patients, the lambda light chain, at diagnosis, it should be elevated. And that's clearly a clue that AL amyloidosis may be accounting for a patient's symptoms. If they're completely normal, generally AL amyloid is not very likely. And we follow these serially during the course of a patient's management so that our expectation is that if we use successful weed killer applications, Darzalex, Velcate, Cytoxin, Dexamethasone, Pomalidomide, Pomalist, Revlimid, whatever, if you use those and you kill the weeds, the source of the light chains, then the involved light chain level will fall. Sometimes we use a minor correction where we really talk about the difference between the involved and uninvolved free light chain. And that's a relatively simple and addresses one of the questions that came through before the meeting started. And that is how do you calculate the difference? And it's a simple subtraction problem. You take the involved light chain and then you subtract from that the level of the uninvolved light chain. And what you end up then is, with, is the difference between the involved and uninvolved. And that generally is a very good number for the serialized monitoring of patients' disease activity. If patients have very low, low levels of the involved minus uninvolved, the difference, generally speaking, they, we would consider that a good or very good or complete hematologic response, depending on the difference. If we're monitoring a patient and we're seeing that number rise, we would be suspicious that we we're having some problem controlling the level of the light chain. One problem that's infiltrated itself into patients' conception of management is the free light chain ratio, which is the ratio, so instead of a difference, it's a quotient of the involved divided by the uninvolved light chain. Uh, we've repeatedly looked at this and found it to be actually mis information and uninformative. And we strongly encourage patients not to look at the light chain ratio because it will lead to some serious management erroneous conclusions. And that they either look only over time at their involved light chain level or look only at the difference between the involved and uninvolved. I want to make a very specific comment about a very specific type of weed killer uh, before I turn things over to Professor Maurer. One of the effective therapies that is applicable to a limited proportion of patients with AL amyloidosis is to treat the garden with very massive doses of weed killer. It's possible to use very high doses of weed killer to irrevocably poison the garden and really just kind of destroy the garden, turn it infertile. Now, if that's all we did, the outcome would be very bad because patients that don't have a garden can't survive because you need to have the normal seeds, plants, and fruits to make blood, carry oxygen, fight infection, and clot the blood. But it is possible to collect seeds from the garden. There are methods that will help move seeds from the bone marrow garden into the bloodstream where they can be collected. And when we talk about these bone marrow seeds being moved from the bone marrow garden into the bloodstream, the technical term that we use for these are stem cells. And when these stem cells move from the garden into the bloodstream, they can actually be extracted from the bloodstream and frozen. And those are frozen, kept in a 
actually liquid nitrogen bath at a very, very cold temperature. And then when a massive dose of weed killer is used to destroy the garden, we can wait 24 to 48 hours. And during this time, it will allow us to let the poison, the weed killer, to leave the ground soil. And then we can take the seeds or stem cells, if you will, out of the freezer and thaw them. And once they're thawed, we can actually replant the garden. And the procedure of thawing the seeds and replanting the garden is when we're replanting, we're really transplanting seeds from the freezer back to the garden. And so that's the concept of stem cell transplantation. And once those seeds are planted, they eventually will regrow and repopulate the garden. Although that will take 12 to 15 days from the time you plant the seeds till the time they grow back. And now your blood starts to show clotting cells and infection fighting cells and oxygen carrying cells. And although this technique is applicable to only a minority of patients with amyloidosis, it really is a relatively effective and just from my own personal experience, since we've done over 800 of these procedures, is that there's a substantial proportion that we're now monitoring 15 and 20 years following their transplant who are ongoing normal light chain levels with no evidence of recurrence and in fact regression of the amyloid involvement that we've seen in the liver, the heart, the kidney, and the nerve. And so this is just a piece of the integrated individualized management uh, that patients receive by their providers. I just want to note that one of the key problems is that amyloidosis is a very rare disorder. It only occurs in one person per 100,000 per year. That number isn't changed very much over the last 30 or 40 years, but it makes it rare. And therefore, for a general practitioner or a general cardiologist, it's not usually top line in terms of why is my patient short of breath or why is my patient fatigued or why is my patient swollen in their legs? And occasionally, why does my patient have such a very, very high cholesterol level? It's really uncommon. An average internist will see a patient with amyloid usually zero times in their career, maybe once. Most oncologists will see this about once every five years. And so there are issues of education and recognition. Uh, following me, you're going to have specialists discuss some of the clues that they see in terms of recognizing this. But it's probably more common than we think. I do believe this is an underdiagnosed disorder. In fact, just looking at kidney biopsies, colander biopsies, if you will, and trying to get the incidence of kidney amyloid. In fact, in patients over the age of 60 who don't have diabetes, nearly 10% of kidney biopsies actually show AL amyloidosis. So it's not that rare. And in fact, there are very simple screening methods to diagnose amyloid that don't require heart biopsy or kidney biopsy or liver biopsy. You can actually find amyloid in the fatty tissue in the abdomen and that's kind of shown with a syringe going by the belly button on the far left. And in fact, Dr. Wiseman was part of the group that originally developed this test for the diagnosis of amyloid. 50% of patients with AL amyloid will have amyloid deposits seen on a bone marrow biopsy. And that's important because virtually all patients with AL amyloid have had a bone marrow examination performed because you want to count the number of weeds in the garden that are responsible for the light chain production. 
So the bone marrow is effective, the fat is effective. We've started doing biopsies of the lip. We find that that has a very high yield of amyloid deposits. And so we can make the diagnosis without having to go to hospital-based invasive biopsies of kidney, heart, liver, and the like, and usually can pick up the diagnosis in about 80% of patients without having to do that. But I think the key isn't the biopsy, it's really the clinician's index of suspicion. Are they thinking correctly in terms of when should I think of amyloid? For oncologists and hematologists, they're following patients who have either MGUS or smoldering multiple myeloma, and oftentimes are looking for what we refer to as myeloma defining events, changes that occur with myeloma, such as bone pain or problems with fractures, and aren't monitoring patients for amyloid related symptoms, such as fatigue, unexplained weight loss, shortness of breath, fluid retention. The same thing goes with cardiologists. Sometimes they'll look at an echocardiogram and see thick heart walls and presuppose that maybe it's from high blood pressure or a rare disorder called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Many patients who go to community cardiologists end up in the cardiac catheterization lab to get an angiogram to be told that they have completely normal coronary arteries, so your heart's fine, your heart's not involved, so to speak. It's also very common for less experienced kidney specialists to see patients with spillage of protein in the urine and try a couple months of prednisone treatment, which is uniformly unsuccessful in the management and then end up with a kidney biopsy. And in all of these instances of abnormal echo, abnormal protein in the urine, the real key is measuring the light chain as part of the screening process. And a lot of the education that the panelists that will be here today are involved in is integrating into the workflow of a cardiologist or a kidney doctor, integrating into that getting light chain measurements when they see patients with unexplained problems with their heart and shortness of breath or reduced efficiency of heart pumping or spillage of protein or abnormal kidney function, measure the light chain because that will help distinguish an amyloid related problem from the dozens of other causes of kidney problems and heart problems. I think with that, what I'm going to do is stop sharing the screen and I'm going to mute myself and I will turn this over then to Dr. Maurer, a professor of cardiology. Not quite yet, but please stay with us for a second, Dr. Gertz. I know we're, we're going to leave you and then you'll be back for the Q&A and we really appreciate that talk. It was really helpful and I think it will help everyone to understand the disease a bit better. Uh, but there's there's two two things you brought up that will answer actually quite a few questions that came in. One of them is when you mentioned you're obviously a proponent of stem cell transplant when someone meets the criteria. And we did have a lot of questions about the criteria for stem cell transplant. And I realize every center is different, but can you give us the criteria that you have at the Mayo Clinic for a patient qualifying for a stem cell transplant? Well, I'll have to tell you, first of all, both Dr. Vessio and Dr. Zonder are experienced uh, in patient selection with transplant. And what I would say is the paramount issue is safety. In other words, you want to be certain that if you decide to transplant a patient, A, you need virtual certainty that they're going to survive and they're not going to succumb to complications of the transplant. And secondly, if there's a significant degree of kidney amyloidosis, the goal of transplant is to prevent someone from ending on dialysis. You don't want the transplant to trigger the need for dialysis. 
So in the very high level view, you want to be sure that there's enough kidney functional reserve so that you won't harm the kidney and enough heart functional reserve that if there were complications during the transplant, there's sufficient heart function in order to actually make it through safely. And in fact, it's very common in our practices that we share decision making with kidney specialists and with heart specialists because sometimes I don't have the competency to determine if heart function is sufficiently preserved for this to be safe. And so I'll involve our amyloid cardiologist to help me decide whether I can do this safely. And of course, part of this is done based on simple things like blood pressure, level of NT, pro B and P and level of troponin. But there's no substitute for having an experienced cardiologist and kidney specialist working as part of the team to help you understand that if you give the high dose weed killer, the chemotherapy, that you're not going to cause irreparable harm. So hence the importance of that great multidisciplinary team that we want to see at all our centers. Integrated team. You can't do this without everybody involved. Okay, thank you. We'll see you back here for our Q&A. So go have breakfast.